Doc Holliday wore many hats in his lifetime. He was known as a gambler, a vagabond, a dentist, a gentleman, and a gunfighter. It is doubtful that even Doc Holliday drank three quarts of whiskey a day, and he didn't kill many men with his six-gun. He was also at one of the most Wild West battles, and thanks to Doc, the battle lasted only 30 seconds. But how much of it is actually true? As we peel back the layers to uncover the reality behind the legend, brace yourself for a journey that may send chills down your spine. A difficult childhood. If you've ever delved into the backstory of Doc Holliday, you'd find a childhood marked by the tumult of war and personal tragedy. Born John Henry Holliday on August 14, 1851, in Griffin, Georgia, to Henry Burroughs, Holliday, and Alice Jane Holliday, his early years were anything but ordinary. His father, Henry, was a multifaceted individual, a druggist, planter, and soldier who had served in both the Mexican-American War and the American Civil War. Alice, Doc's mother, was renowned for her southern charm, while his father's military career saw him rise to the rank of major during the Civil War. However, illness forced him to resign from his position in 1862. Seeking refuge from the encroaching Union troops, the Holiday family relocated to Valdosta, Georgia, nestled near the Florida line. In Valdosta, the Holidays quickly became fixtures in the community, with Henry's stature growing to the point where he was elected mayor in 1876, a testament to his standing within the town. But amidst these societal advancements, tragedy struck young John Henry when his beloved mother, Alice, succumbed to tuberculosis on September 16, 1866. Her passing deeply affected the 15-year-old as he and his mother shared a close bond. The grieving period was short-lived, however, as Henry quickly remarried Rachel Martin just three months later, on December 18, 1866. Interestingly, Rachel was only a few years older than Doc himself, adding a layer of complexity to the family dynamic. Notably, Doc Holliday's family history was also marked by the presence of an adoptive brother, Francisco, whom Henry brought home after the Mexican-American War. Tragically, Francisco too fell victim to tuberculosis, mirroring the fate of Alice. It was during this tumultuous period that Doc received his own diagnosis of tuberculosis, facing the grim prognosis of only a few months to live, a grim reminder of the familial predisposition to the disease. In hindsight, one can't help but see the ominous thread of tuberculosis woven throughout the Holiday family history, adding a somber layer to the already complex narrative of one of the Wild West's most enigmatic figures. He was a brilliant student. Despite his later reputation as a formidable figure of the Wild West, Doc Holliday's childhood was marked by a surprising contrast. Contrary to expectations, he was anything but unruly. Instead, he exhibited a gentle and easygoing demeanor. In fact, during his early years, Holiday faced his own set of challenges, contending with speech impediments and a cleft palate. However, through perseverance and the unwavering support of his mother, he overcame these obstacles through corrective surgery and diligent lessons. Records indicate that young Holiday was an exemplary student, displaying a thirst for knowledge that far surpassed his peers. While still a teenager, he attended the prestigious Valdosta Institute, where he immersed himself in a diverse range of subjects, including rhetoric, mathematics, and history. Not content with just mastering the standard curriculum, he went above and beyond by becoming fluent in languages such as Latin, French, and ancient Greek. By the age of 20, Holliday had achieved a remarkable feat. He earned his Doctor of Dental Surgery degree from the esteemed Pennsylvania College of Dental Surgery. However, due to age restrictions, he had to wait until his 21st birthday to officially practice dentistry. Undeterred by this delay, he seized the opportunity to gain valuable experience by working as an assistant to his classmate August Jameson Fuchs Jr. in St. Louis, Missouri. Shortly thereafter, Holiday made the pivotal decision to relocate to Atlanta, 
where he joined a dental practice and embarked on the journey of establishing his professional career. To facilitate this transition, he resided with his uncle and his family, laying the groundwork for his future endeavors. As fate would have it, just weeks before his anticipated birthday milestone, Holiday's fortunes took a significant turn when renowned dentist Arthur Ford advertised in Atlanta papers that Holiday would serve as his substitute during Ford's absence at dental meetings. This unforeseen opportunity proved to be a crucial juncture in Doc Holliday's career trajectory, setting him on a path that would ultimately lead to his legendary status in the annals of Western history. A risk taker. Following his ventures in dentistry, Doc Holliday made a significant move to Dallas, where he formed a partnership with Dr. John Seeger, a trusted family friend. Together, they gained recognition for their exceptional dental work, earning prestigious awards at the annual Fair of the North Texas Agricultural Mechanical and Bloodstock Association. Their office, located along Elm Street between Market and Austin Streets, became renowned for its quality services and garnered further acclaim when they clinched top honors at the Dallas County Fair for the best set of teeth in gold, best in vulcanized rubber, and best set of artificial teeth and dental wear. Despite their success, the partnership eventually dissolved on March 2, 1874, prompting Doc Holliday to establish his own practice above the Dallas County Bank at the corner of Main and Lamar Streets. Despite battling persistent cough spells due to tuberculosis, Doc discovered a new avenue for income, gambling. With a natural talent for games of chance, he soon found gambling to be his primary source of livelihood. However, Doc's newfound prosperity was marred by legal troubles. On May 12, 1874, he faced indictment in Dallas, alongside 12 others for illegal gambling activities. Despite this setback, Doc continued his gambling pursuits, which eventually led to another brush with the law in January 1875. During a heated exchange with saloon keeper Charles Austin, gunfire erupted, resulting in Doc's arrest. Fortunately, no one was injured, and Doc was found not guilty of the charges. Subsequently, Doc relocated his dental offices to Denison, Texas, but ongoing legal issues and a significant gambling fine in Dallas prompted him to reassess his situation. It was a pivotal moment in his life, one that would eventually lead him down a new path filled with challenges and adventures. A new direction. Continuing his journey of adventure and uncertainty, Doc Holliday embarked on a new chapter in Denver, Colorado, during the summer of 1875. Under the guise of the alias Tom Mackey, he found employment as a faro dealer at John A. B. Babb's Theater located at 357 Blake Street. However, trouble seemed to follow him wherever he went, as evidenced by a confrontation with Bud Ryan, a notorious gambler, which left Ryan seriously wounded after a knife fight instigated by Holliday. As the seasons changed, so did Doc's whereabouts. Upon learning of the gold rush in Wyoming, he departed Denver and arrived in Cheyenne on February 5, 1876. There, he secured a job as a dealer at the Bella Union Saloon, owned by Bob's partner, Thomas Miller. When Miller relocated the Bella Union to Deedwood, South Dakota, in the autumn of 1876 to Capitalis, on the burgeoning gold rush, Doc accompanied him on the journey. However, Doc's restless spirit soon led him back to Cheyenne, then Denver, and eventually to Kansas, where he paid a visit to a relative. His travels continued as he made his way to Breen Ridge, Texas, where he engaged in gambling activities. It was during this time that he found himself embroiled in a violent altercation with fellow gambler Henry K. H., resulting in holiday being severely beaten with his own walking stick. Both men faced legal consequences, with Holliday enduring significant injuries from the encounter. Despite the ordeal, Doc Holliday's resilience shone through, aided in part by the support of his cousin, George Henry Holliday, who journeyed west to assist in his recovery. Once healed, Doc ventured to Fort Griffin, Texas, a pivotal moment that would set the stage for encounters and connections that would profoundly impact his life. 
Doc had his only known relationship with an intelligent streetwalker named Big Nose Kate Forney. At John Shaney's saloon, Doc Holliday's path crossed with that of Mary Catherine, Big Nose Kate Haroni, a woman who would become central to his life in more ways than one. It was within the dimly lit confines of this establishment that their fateful encounter took place, where Haroni, working as a dance hall girl and prostitute, caught the eye of the enigmatic Doc Holliday. Despite their differing backgrounds, they found a curious affinity for one another. She with her fiery spirit and he with his tumultuous nature. Their connection deepened as they navigated the rough and tumble world of the Wild West together. Doc, known for his skills as a card dealer, formed an unlikely alliance with lawman Wyatt Earp during this time. Wyatt, in pursuit of notorious train robber Dave Rudabaugh, sought Doc's expertise and knowledge of the local scene to aid in the capture of the fugitive. Doc Holliday's assistance proved invaluable, and their successful collaboration cemented a burgeoning friendship between the two men. However, Doc's life was not without its complexities, and his relationship with Mary Catherine Haroni was fraught with its own challenges. Despite attempts to pursue a more conventional path by establishing a dental practice in Dodge City, tensions between Doc and Kate often simmered beneath the surface. Conflicts arose, leading to Kate's eventual departure from Dodge City and Doc's return to the familiar world of gambling and uncertainty. Doc saved Wyatt's life. Amidst the ebb and flow of friendships, new bonds emerged to weather the tempest of the Wild West. One such pivotal moment unfolded within the raucous confines of the Long Branch Saloon in Dodge City, where a chance encounter forever altered the course of history. On that fateful night, tensions simmered as rowdy cowboys disrupted the tranquility of the establishment, their unruly behavior unsettling patrons, including Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp. In the midst of the chaos, a chilling remark hung in the air, a veiled threat directed at Earp. In a swift and decisive move, Doc Holliday intervened, his revolver drawn with lightning speed, pressing against the temple of the instigator. Wyatt Earp, reflecting on that moment in later years, credited Doc's timely intervention as the catalyst for their enduring friendship. Their paths intertwined once more as the winds of fate ushered them toward the Arizona mining town of Tombstone in late 1879. With Wyatt Earp leading the charge, his brothers Virgil and Morgan by his side, Doc Holliday followed suit, drawn to the promise of new beginnings and untold adventures. Yet, even amidst the promise of camaraderie and shared exploits, trouble seemed to shadow Doc's every step, a relentless specter that refused to be shaken, becoming Doc Holliday. As the winds of change swept through the once rowdy streets of Dodge City, Doc Holliday found himself drawn into a new chapter of adventure and intrigue. By 1879, Dodge had shed its wild frontier facade, morphing into a bastion of civility that no longer resonated with the rugged souls who had thrived amidst its lawless beginnings. Sensing the call of untamed frontiers where fortune beckoned, Doc, alongside his compatriots, set their sights on fresh horizons untouched by the encroaching hand of civilization. By this juncture, Doc had already carved out a formidable reputation, not merely for his prowess at the card table, his primary vocation, but also for his lightning-fast draw as a gunslinger. His association with Wyatt Earp and the Earp brothers particularly Morgan and Virgil, ushered in a new era of opportunity and danger. In September 1880, Doc Holliday made his grand entrance into the silver mining boomtown of Tombstone, nestled within the rugged expanse of the Arizona Territory. Before his arrival in Tombstone, however, Doc made a strategic detour to Prescott, ensuring his financial affairs were in order. The Earps had been holding the fort in Tombstone since December 1879, their presence a bulwark against the encroaching tide of lawlessness. Rumors whispered that they had summoned Doc Holliday to their aid when tensions simmered to a boiling point in their ongoing feud with the cowboy faction, an 1881 accusation. 
Upon his arrival in Tombstone, Doc wasted no time immersing himself in the tumultuous tapestry of local politics and violence that gripped the town. It was amidst this swirling maelstrom of intrigue and conflict that the stage was set for the fateful confrontation that would go down in history as the infamous gunfight at the O.K. Corral in October 1881. And thus, the flames of destiny were ignited, propelling Doc Holliday into the heart of a saga that would etch his name into the annals of legend. Things took a dramatic turn following a stagecoach robbery and murder in Benson, Arizona, in 1881. Doc Holliday found himself entangled in the ensuing chaos, prompting his friend Wyatt Earp to step in like a knight in shining armor. Wyatt's aim? To smooth things over by greasing the palms of their cowboy rival, Ike Clanton. His motive? Well, partly to clear Doc's name, but let's face it, also to keep himself out of trouble. While Wyatt was busy concocting his plan, the rival sheriff, Johnny Behan, seized an opportunity. Meanwhile, Doc's former associate, Haroni, found herself in Bean's company after a falling out with him. Bean, ever the opportunist, lent her a sympathetic ear and a few drinks, coaxing her into signing an affidavit shifting the blame onto Doc. However, Wyatt's scheme took an unexpected turn. Armed with Kate's signed confession, he realized Clanton's assistance was unnecessary. Consequently, Doc found himself facing trial. But the game wasn't over for him just yet. Thanks to a stroke of luck, Kate had a change of heart, retracting her previous statement to Bean. As a result, the charges against Doc were dropped, and the case was closed. Yet, this wasn't a fairy tale ending. The cowboys, harboring resentment toward the Earps and Doc Holliday, began issuing threats, setting the stage for a real-life showdown. Erp Vendetta Ride Just as it seemed the turmoil in Tombstone had settled, the situation took a turn for the worse. The tension escalated with Virgil Earp becoming the target of an ambush in December 1881, resulting in severe injuries. And if that wasn't tragic enough, Morgan Earp fell victim to another ambush, losing his life in March 1882. Witnesses pointed fingers at certain cowboys for the attacks, with evidence suggesting their involvement in nefarious activities. Following Virgil's injury, Wyatt Earp took on a new role as a deputy United States Marshal. He enlisted the help of Doc Holliday, Warren Earp, Sherman McMasters, and Turkey Creek Jack Johnson to assist him in maintaining order. However, the loss of Morgan spurred Wyatt and his associates to intensify their efforts. They facilitated Virgil and his wife Allie's departure to Colton, California, where Virgil could recuperate from his shotgun wound under the care of his father. But the events took a chaotic turn in Tucson on March 20, 1882. Reports alleged that Frank Stilwell and Ike Clanton were lurking near the railroad cars, poised to launch another attack on Virgil at dawn. The next morning, Stilwell's lifeless body was discovered by the tracks, riddled with buckshot and bullet holes. Wyatt Earp later confessed to taking him out with a shotgun, adding another layer of intrigue to the unfolding saga. Indeed, it was a tumultuous and unpredictable journey through the Wild West. Amidst the escalating tensions, Tucson Justice of the Peace, Charles Meyer issued arrest warrants for five members of the Earp Party, including Doc Holliday. Subsequently, they made a brief return to Tombstone, where they were joined by Texas Jack Vermillion and potentially others. The following morning, a faction of the Earp Posse, comprising Wyatt, Warren, Holliday, Sherman McMaster, and Turkey Creek Johnson, embarked on a journey about 16 kilometers east to Pete Spence's ranch. Their destination was a woodcutting camp, situated off the Karawa Road below the south pass of the Dragon Mountains. Upon their arrival at the wood camp, witnessed by Theodore Judah, the Earp Posse sought out Pete Spence and Florentino Indian Charlie Cruz. Discovering that Spence was incarcerated and Cruz was engaged in woodcutting nearby, they proceeded to the designated area. Shortly thereafter, Judah heard a barrage of gunfire, consisting of about a dozen shots. Concerned by Cruz's absence the following morning, Judah embarked on a search, only to discover Cruz's lifeless body 
riddled with bullet holes. The scene was nothing short of shocking and disturbing, adding another layer of complexity to the already volatile situation. Gunfight at Iron Springs. Indeed, if we delve deeper into the chronicles of Doc Holliday's encounters with the Earp brothers, we uncover another gripping chapter, the gunfight at Iron Springs. Just two days following the tumultuous events, the Earp posse embarked on a journey to Iron Springs, nestled in the Whetstone Mountains. Their objective? To rendezvous with Charlie Smith, anticipated to arrive bearing a hefty sum of support from their allies back in Tombstone. With Wyatt and Holiday leading the way, the six lawmen ascended a small rise overlooking the springs, only to be met with an unexpected sight, eight cowboys camping in the vicinity. Records of the ensuing altercation were scarce, with only Wyatt Earp and Doc Holiday providing an account of the skirmish. As tensions escalated, Curly Bill, one of the cowboys, swiftly seized his shotgun upon spotting Wyatt in the lead, initiating a barrage of gunfire. Amidst the chaos, Wyatt and Holiday found themselves in the midst of a fierce exchange of bullets. Facing a precarious situation, Texas Jack Vermillion's horse was struck by gunfire, collapsing on him and trapping his leg beneath its weight, with his rifle wedged underneath. Forced into a tactical retreat, Holiday, Johnson, and McMaster scrambled for cover, seeking refuge from the onslaught of bullets. Unwilling to concede defeat, Wyatt Earp retaliated with unyielding determination, taking aim with his trusty shotgun and firing directly at Curly Bill. The outcome? A decisive blow that nearly severed Curly Bill in half, sending him plummeting into the waters of the spring, never to rise again. As the cowboys retaliated with a flurry of gunfire, chaos ensued, with bullets whizzing through the air. In the midst of the skirmish, the herd posse remained steadfast, albeit suffering a poignant loss. Vermilion's loyal horse succumbed to the onslaught of bullets, collapsing to the ground. Meanwhile, Wyatt Earp, renowned for his lightning-fast draw, swiftly took aim and discharged his firearm, striking Johnny Barnes in the chest and grazing Milt Hicks in the arm. Amidst the fray, Vermilion found himself in a perilous predicament, pinned beneath his fallen steed while attempting to retrieve his rifle. Sensing the urgency of the situation, Doc Holliday sprang into action, swooping in to provide much-needed assistance, guiding Vermilion to safety behind makeshift cover. However, Wyatt Earp faced his own set of challenges amid the chaos. Struggling to mount his horse amidst the mayhem, Wyatt grappled with the unruly cartridge belt, which seemed intent on slipping down his legs at the most inopportune moment. The air was thick with the crackle of gunfire as bullets zipped past, narrowly missing their mark. Wyatt's long coat bore the brunt of the onslaught, pierced by bullets on both sides, while one bullet grazed his boot heel and another sent a fiery kiss to his saddle horn. With agile maneuvers and sheer determination, Wyatt managed to evade the onslaught, finally mounting his horse and making a swift escape from the chaotic battleground. Even Sherman McMaster, amid the frenzy, found himself at the receiving end of a close call as a bullet sliced through the straps of his field glasses, narrowly missing him. Friends for life. Following the tumultuous events at Iron Springs, Doc Holliday and his companions found themselves in a precarious predicament, with warrants looming over their heads due to the demise of Stillwell. Sensing the urgency of the situation, they swiftly devised a plan to evade the authorities, opting to flee Arizona and seek refuge in the neighboring territories of New Mexico and Colorado. However, amidst their flight, a rift emerged between Wyatt Earp and Holiday, erstwhile comrades once hailed as heroes. A heated disagreement erupted between the two, reaching its boiling point during a seemingly innocuous meal at Fat Charlie's The Retreat Restaurant in Albuquerque. It was there that Holiday's ill-advised comment, casting aspersions on Earp's heritage, ignited a fierce confrontation. In a fit of anger, Wyatt stormed out, severing the ties that once bound them as inseparable allies. Thus, the
the end of an era marked the dissolution of their legendary partnership. Meanwhile, Wyatt Earp sought refuge at the residence of Henry and Jaffa in New Albuquerque, prominent figures in the local community. Jaffa, a respected businessman and president of the Board of Trade, graciously extended his hospitality to Earp, hosting him in his home. It was during this period that an intriguing revelation emerged, shedding light on Earp's personal life. According to accounts relayed by Otero, a letter from Jaffa disclosed Earp's adherence to Jewish customs, symbolized by his respectful gesture of touching the mezuzah upon entering the household. Furthermore, Jaffa confided in Otero about Earp's romantic involvement with a Jewish woman, hinting at a deeper connection between Earp and Josephine Marcus than previously known. Wyatt Earp's vehement reaction to Holiday's ethnic slight serves as a testament to the complexities of his personal relationships and the uncharted territories of his heart during that tumultuous period in his life. Doc's Last Days As the years passed, Doc Holliday found himself settling in Colorado after a stint in Leadville. However, life at the high altitude took its toll on his already fragile health, and his once formidable gambling skills seemed to wane in the changing landscape of the rapidly urbanizing West. By 1887, Holiday, prematurely aged and battling poor health, sought refuge at the Hotel Glenwood near the therapeutic hot springs of Glenwood Springs, Colorado, hoping to find solace in the healing waters. Yet, ironically, it's believed that the sulfurous fumes emanating from the springs may have exacerbated his condition rather than providing relief. In his final moments, Holiday, perhaps resigned to his fate, requested a sip of whiskey and found amusement in the irony of his situation, remarking on his bootless feet as he passed away. It was a stark departure from the legendary gunslinger's image, as no one had ever anticipated his demise occurring in such a mundane manner, in bed, with his boots off. Contrary to popular belief, Wyatt Earp, Holiday's longtime friend and companion, was absent during his final moments and only learned of his passing months later. On November 8, 1887, Doc Holliday breathed his last, leaving behind a legacy shrewded in mystery and intrigue. Today, Holliday's final resting place is marked by a gravestone in Linwood Cemetery, offering a picturesque view of Glenwood Springs. However, controversy surrounds the exact location of his burial with conflicting accounts casting doubt on whether he was indeed interred in the marked grave or even in that cemetery at all. Given that Holiday passed away during the winter months when the ground was frozen, it's likely that he was laid to rest on the same day, possibly in a temporary grave. The challenging terrain of the old cemetery, situated on a steep road up the mountain, raises questions about the possibility of his remains being relocated later on. However, the lack of concrete evidence and the absence of any attempts to exhume and examine the grave only add to the enigma surrounding Doc Holliday's final resting place. Record of Violence While Doc Holliday's reputation as a quick-draw gunfighter is widely acknowledged in historical accounts, his accuracy with a pistol wasn't always impeccable. In documented pistol confrontations, he wounded Billy Allen in the arm, grazed Charles White on the scalp, and missed entirely when aiming at saloon keeper Charles Austin. Holiday's arrival in Tombstone in 1880 was marked by an unfortunate incident where, in a state of inebriation, he accidentally shot Milt Joyce, the owner of the Oriental Saloon, and his bartender Parker neither of whom were the intended targets of his dispute. This reckless act resulted in Holiday facing charges of assault and battery. Despite the legendary tales attributing numerous deaths to Holiday in popular folklore, contemporary newspapers and legal records provide little to no evidence supporting these claims, except for the case involving Mike Gordon in 1879. Similarly, there's a lack of concrete evidence to support the stories of Holiday engaging in knife fights, as often recounted by early biographers. Hence, it's prudent to approach these colorful anecdotes 
with a healthy dose of skepticism. In public, Holiday displayed the requisite fierceness expected of a professional gambler seeking respect in Tom Stoney. In a recorded exchange with Johnny Ringo in January 1882, Holiday famously uttered, All I want of you is ten paces out in the street, suggesting a willingness to settle disputes with deadly force. However, the potential gunfight was thwarted by the intervention of the Tombstone police, who arrested both men. Holiday's exact involvement in the deaths of Frank Stilwell and the other three men during the Earp Vendetta ride remains shrouded in uncertainty, although he was present at the events. It's speculated that Holiday may have been the second shooter in Stilwell's demise while he was responsible for killing Tom McClory. Additionally, either Holiday or Morgan Earp fired the fatal shot that ended Frank McClory's life, marking a moment of intense and tragic violence. His legacy, Doc Holliday remains an enduring icon from the tumultuous era of the American Old West, forever linked with the legendary Wyatt Earp and the infamous gunfight at the O.K. Corral. Their friendship has become the stuff of Western folklore, akin to the classic sidekick dynamic seen in cowboy movies. Holliday is portrayed as the steadfast deputy, unwaveringly loyal to Earp through the chaotic and perilous moments they face together including the showdown at the O.K. Corral and the Her Vendetta saga. Amidst the turmoil, violence, and hardships of the frontier, Doc Holliday stood by Wyatt Earp, embodying an ideal of unwavering loyalty and camaraderie. Their on-screen portrayal symbolizes a bond of true friendship and brotherhood amidst the lawless landscape of the Wild West, serving as a modern-day emblem of sticking by one's companions through thick and thin. In Fayetteville, Georgia, the home of Doc Holliday's uncle is proudly marked with a historical sign, a testament to the enduring legacy of the Wild West legend. Moreover, a life-size statue sculpted by Dan Bates immortalizes Holliday and Earp at the historic railroad depot in Tucson, Arizona, commemorating their partnership. The dedication of the statue on March 20, 2005, coincided with the 122nd anniversary of Wyatt Earp's confrontation with Frank Stilwell, highlighting their historical significance in the region. Across various towns and cities, celebrations and events pay homage to Doc Holliday's legacy. In Griffin, Georgia, Doc Holliday Days is an annual shindig celebrating the birthplace of the legendary figure. Similarly, Valdosta, Georgia, hosted a Doc Holliday lookalike contest as part of their CES centennial celebration in January 2010. Meanwhile, Tombstone, Arizona, has embraced its Wild West heritage by hosting Doc Holliday events every second weekend of August since 2017. Featuring gunfights, parades, and lookalike contests, these festivities serve as a lively tribute to the notorious gunfighter dentist. As we delve into the captivating saga of Doc Holliday, his legend continues to fascinate and intriguous, leaving us with countless questions and reflections on the realities of the Wild West. What aspects of Doc Holliday's life and legacy do you find most compelling? Share your thoughts in the comments below. And if you want more captivating content about the real Doc Holliday, don't forget to like and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching. Until next time, bye.